Welcome to the CJD Foundation Virtual Conference. We thank our partners, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center and our sponsors, Charles River Labs and Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Tonight, we feature one of three panels showing updates from the eight scientists who were awarded grants by the CJD Foundation in January 2021. Everyone who donates to the CJD Foundation and Two Strides for CJD has a part in funding these projects. We also send special thanks to the families who have donated memorial research grants to support these important research studies. Together, you are helping the prion disease community unlock answers to some pressing questions about prion disease. To learn more about family memorial grants or about Strides for CJD, visit cjdfoundation.org or call our office. During tonight's panel presentation, please enter your questions as they occur to you. The panel will answer as many as possible following the presentations, focusing on tonight's topics. If your question is not answered, feel free to email it to us at help at cjdfoundation.org. For information on topics not covered tonight, please visit our conference website to view previously recorded presentations. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Joel Watts of the University of Toronto. Dr. Watts obtained his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Western Ontario and did his graduate studies at the University of Toronto. He did his postdoctoral studies at the lab of Nobel laureate, Dr. Stanley Prusner at the University of California, San Francisco. In 2014, he started his own lab at the Tan Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases at University of Toronto. Dr. Watts is the past recipient of research funding from the CJD Foundation and has spoken at a number of our conferences. He will introduce tonight's speakers and will moderate the Q&A panel following the presentations. Welcome everyone to the continuation of the 2021 CJD Foundation Virtual Conference. Tonight's presentation will feature the second panel of distinguished prion scientists that were awarded research grants from the CJD Foundation in the most recent competition. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Joel Watts and I'm an Associate Professor of Biochemistry at the Tan Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases within the University of Toronto in Canada. Some of you may remember me from my presentations at previous CJD Foundation family conferences. My lab uses animal and cellular models to study how prions uh, can sometimes spread from one species to another and to try and understand why prions occasionally form spontaneously in the brain as occurs in sporadic CJD. I am also a previous recipient of a research grant from the CJD Foundation. And on behalf of all current and previous grant recipients, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the families whose donations and fundraising efforts make these awards possible. I truly believe that these grants will accelerate our united quest to better understand and ultimately treat the human prion diseases, including CJD, GSS, and FFI. It is my distinct pleasure to serve as moderator for this all Canadian panel of prion scientists. I suppose the only way this session could be more Canadian is if it were being held in a hockey arena with all of us eating poutine and drinking maple syrup, eh? Everyone is in for a big treat as we have two of the leading experts on human prion diseases as our speakers tonight, Dr. Valerie Sim and Dr. Stephanie Booth. I'd like to thank the CJD Foundation for the invitation to participate in this exciting scientific session and for their continued advocacy for further research on prion diseases. My role as moderator of tonight's session is to introduce our distinguished speakers and then to facilitate a question and answer period following the presentations. In many ways, tonight's first speaker, Dr. Valerie Sim, needs no introduction. If you're lucky enough to have seen Dr. Sim speak at past CJD Foundation conferences, then you know that she leaves a lasting impression. To say that Dr. Sim is multi-talented would be an extreme understatement. In her own words, 
Dr. Sim identifies as a scientist who practices medicine to support her music habit. By day, she is a prion scientist at the Center for Prions and Protein Folding Diseases at the University of Alberta, and a clinical neurologist consultant for rapidly progressive dementia cases locally and throughout Canada. By night, at least prior to the COVID pandemic, she is a professional violinist and a fiddler. Dr. Sim completed her undergraduate and medical degrees at the University of Calgary and her neurology residency at the University of Ottawa. She then conducted a postdoctoral fellowship in prion disease research at the National Institutes of Health Rocky Mountain Laboratories facility in Hamilton, Montana, under the supervision of Dr. Byron Coey. Dr. Sim returned to Canada in 2009 to join the Division of Neurology at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. She was promoted to associate professor with tenure in July of 2016. In her research lab, Dr. Sim is well known for using prion infected brain slices in a dish to ask how a prion size and shape influences patterns of disease and risks of transmission, as well as how targeting multiple steps along the disease pathway might produce more effective treatments. Clinically, she is medical director of the Canadian CJD Association and the co-founder of the Edmonton Cognitive Neurology Clinic. Dr. Sim is also passionate about promoting science communication and has published a TEDx talk on prion disease. She regularly presents the science of prion disease to diverse communities across Alberta, Canada, and internationally. Tonight, Dr. Sim will be talking about research associated with her CJD Foundation grant entitled Strain-Specific Pathology and Spread in Prion Organotypic Slice Culture Assay Infected with Different Strains of Creutzfeldt-Jakob Disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Valerie Sim to the virtual podium. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, virtually, unfortunately, to tell you a bit about what we've been working on this past year with respect to our slice cultures and strain-specific pathology. So first I'd like to thank the sponsors and all of you really for the gift you give to keep this research going. Um, so I wanna recognize Katie Pohl Dopiric Memorial Research Grant, the Jeffrey A. Smith Memorial Research Grant, the Robert J. Esposito Memorial Research Grant, Kendall Palmer Memorial Grant, and of course the Strides for CJD Grant. Now today what I'd like to talk a bit about is variation and that specifically refers to how patients present with CJD. You may be aware that patients present with a variety of symptoms. Sometimes it's prominent visual symptoms, sometimes it's just incoordination, Sometimes people have dementia and cognitive changes early in disease, sometimes late. And this can complicate the diagnosis, even delay the diagnosis at times. But my question today is why is there variation? In neurology, we say it's location. The brain region that is affected dictates the symptoms that appear. So if you have a stroke in your occipital lobe, you're going to have visual loss in the opposite side. And we do know that prion diseases target different brain regions. But again, why would the prion target a different brain region? We know that prions come in different flavors, different strains, sizes, shape. You know that there's the normal form of the prion protein shown here. And it, when it misfolds, it takes on a different shape. There's still a lot of debate in the field about what that shape is. There's some recent models that have been proposed to try to describe that shape. And even here, we know that it can't just be one shape but there are a variety of shapes, each associated with a different strain. More than shape, it's also size that differs. For example, shown here is a recent work published by my group showing size distributions of these clumps of prions. In the blue, you can see that the small, uh, this particular strain has more smaller aggregates than some of the other strains. And we think this too can correlate a bit with phenotype, that is how patients present, what is the clinical correlate. So how might this work? So here's my poor man's drawing of a brain. And let's think about how prions might target different parts of the brain. So let's make us an assumption that prions could potentially target any part of the brain. Why would you have disease or phenotype coming from one area more than another? 
Well, it's possible that certain areas of the brain just aren't as efficient at replicating. So they don't build up as much prion, therefore there's not as much damage and you don't have symptoms from that area of the brain. Another possibility is that certain brain areas might still accumulate the prions, but somehow they're less prone to damage from that particular type of prion. So we wanted to think about how we could test this question, and we use something called the prion organotypic slice culture assay for this purpose. You can think of it like prion disease in a dish. Basically, we take the mouse brain, we slice it up, and we put it in a dish, and then we can sprinkle prions on top of it of any strain we want and watch how the disease develops in the dish itself. And this is just thought you might be interested. This is actually what it looks like by naked eye when we culture it. And at the bottom, you can see cerebellar slice culture. That's the back part of the brain. And that's how this assay was initially developed by Adriano Aguzzi's group. And this is on the bottom, you see what cerebellum looks like. On the top is what we've been doing now is slicing the front part of the brain, the basically the rest of the brain in coronal slices. So slicing it as if you're slicing your face. And we wanted to do this because we're very interested in the different brain regions and how they are targeted with prions. So this is what they look like just in the dish. This is what they look like when you label them the cells with different colors under a confocal microscope. So here's an example of a zoom in on a slice. The red is the neurons, blue are microglia, the cyan are astrocytes, and the green is actually the prion protein. And if we focus more just on the prion protein, in this slide in green, you can see the clumps, I think, of prion protein that are building up in the disease. And interestingly, in blue in this image are the microglia. And at the very end of the talk, I'm going to mention microglia a bit more. So in these slice cultures, where are the prions accumulating? And do we see differences with different strains? If you look closely, here's a sort of a screenshot of a number of strains that have been looked at. At the top is our control, where you don't see any signal. ME7 is a particular strain where, again, it's very weak. We don't think we get a lot of infection from this particular strain. But as you go down in RML, 22L, and 87V, I hope you can appreciate that the pattern we're seeing is very different and seems to relate to which strain is involved. This had previously been looked at in cerebellum, but this is the first time we've documented this difference in these coronal slices. The other question is, where is cell death occurring in these slices? Is that also different depending on strain? Well, here's a few examples of what the pattern of neurons looks like. So in the top are some control uninfected slices, and bottom is an example of RML. And you can see that here too, it's biology, we have some variation, but in general, we see less neurons in the infected slices, as you might expect. But what we found particularly interesting was the region that is lost in most of the slices. So if you look at the top, you can see right here, hopefully, this is actually the hippocampus. And in our infected cultures, if you look in the same area, we don't see those hippocampal neurons. This dentate gyrus seems to be gone. And in fact, if we quantify it, we can see that while maybe 10% of our control slices don't have any hippocampus left, the infected samples have a great deal of dentate gyrus loss. Now, that suggests that prion infection, actually regardless of strain, seems to target the hippocampal neurons in culture. But that also tells us it's not necessarily specific. It's not telling us why one strain would cause a particular phenotype. So then we thought, could it be that it's about the spread within the slice itself? So instead of assuming that the entire brain is coated all at once with prions, as we would normally do in our slice culture, we immerse the entire brain in prions, perhaps there are certain areas of the brain where it spreads more efficiently than other areas of the brain. Is there a way we could test that in our dish? This is where we thought about doing wire experiments. Essentially, we cultured the slice as usual, but then we took wires and incubated them in the prions dried them, and then put them on top of the culture to see if that could target specific brain regions to start the infectious process. So here's an example of what it actually looks like. 
you put the wires on top of the slices. We had visions originally of stabbing the slices directly, but this is a much magnified image and it's very challenging to manipulate these particular wires. So we did this to start. In the middle panel is simply an, uh, a picture of what the slices look like after we transfer them to a membrane without any labeling or staining. Then we digest away all the protein except for the prions, and that's what's in the right panel. So you can see sort of those dark splotches. Those are the prions after 30 days of infection. And I hope you can appreciate that they sort of line up along where the wires are. I'll show you another example here, which might be a bit clearer. Again, on the right are the dishes with the wires placed, and immediately beside it to the left, you can see these streaks of prions along where the wires were. And I should say these wires were removed seven days before the actual transfer to membrane was occurred. We also did some controls, of course, some uninfected cultures and even some slices exposed to an infected wire, but slices that themselves don't express prion proteins, so can't propagate any of the infectivity. And there we didn't see any signal. So this was at day 30. We thought, well, I wonder if this is the start of infection in these specific regions, but will it then progress fully to the entire slice or not? So we've just recently done some day 60 examples, again, exposed to wire. And we have found that in this case, it does start to resemble the pattern where we infected it just by immersing the whole slice. So you may recall, this is an RML where we infected without the wire and the histoblot beside it shows infection with the wire, but given time to spread through the whole brain. So we are still doing these studies. We're starting to do other strains now. And it does appear that at the moment, focal infection at given sites still spreads to the same strain distribution. But of course, what about human strains? So we've done some of these experiments with human strains as well, using a mouse that expresses human PRP as slice culture. So our early experiments were very positive because we were seeing this detection of abnormal prion protein in a number of different strains of human prions in culture after 43 days. So over the past months, well, suffice to say, COVID has put a little bit of a limitation on what we've been able to do, but we got in some really important controls. So we took mice that don't express prion protein, and we did the same control experiments and added CJD brain and looked for any signal. Of course, these slices should not propagate because they don't contain PRP. But we found trace amounts shown here at day 14, day 28, day 35, trace amounts of prions left in those cultures, telling us that we haven't fully gotten rid of the initial inoculum. Now, if we compare it to the infection that we see in the actual TG human mice, it's not as strong. So we do think we're propagating something, but it's challenging because now we think there's a bit of residual in addition. And we checked the other strains as well and essentially found very similar findings. So what do we do about this? Well, this is where we turn to the wires because here we can just put a very specific targeted inoculum through a wire without spreading it throughout the entire dish. We actually tested a whole bunch of different Comp different wires, stainless steel, nickel, copper, etc., and really found that steel and actually acupuncture pins were the only ones that wouldn't oxidize. And we're hoping that acupuncture pins could actually be more precise. Instead of laying them across the slice, we could actually stab the slice. So we've here I'm showing you that we can bind the prions to the wires, and then we put them into culture. Unfortunately, after 58 days, this blank lane here, this says we did not detect infection after skewering our slices. And when we went back and looked at the pins that we put into those slices, we couldn't find the prions on the, on the pins anymore. In fact, we looked at a higher uh, contrast and really, if there's anything, it's really, really low level. So, where are we now? It looks like CJD prions may be propagating in culture, 
but we've got that residual leftover from the initial infection, making it hard to distinguish new infection from old. So we want a more precise way to infect them and hopefully a more targeted way. So when we move to wires, it makes sense because we can target a particular area. There won't be residual anywhere. And they're working quite well for our rodent adapted scrapie. But so far, it seems like the pins themselves lose the CJD prions. So as often happens in science, uh, it's not so much that you make lemonade out of lemons, but the question coming from an experiment sometimes leads to new questions. And our question now is where did they go? Where did the prions go? So let's go back and think about this. I was suggesting that perhaps regions for uh, specificity involved easier propagation or spread, but maybe some brain areas are better able to clear prions. So that is now leading us into the microglia. These are these resident macrophages. They're a sort of inflammatory cell, and there's a lot of literature growing on that they can be either good or bad in the context of disease. We know if you suppress them in culture, you can increase infection rates. So perhaps this is our next step in human cultures. And we want to ask, do microglia have a strain preference? Could they be the reason that certain strains preferentially target certain areas of the brain because they can be taken up by macrophages in those areas of the brain? So that is the story to be continued. And I want to, in the last few seconds, thank, of course, the people in my lab who've done the work. Here's a picture of us all pre-COVID when I still had short hair and we could actually be together. Satish has done a lot of the work on the CJD cultures. Haley is another culture guru, as is Grant. And Leo has done a lot of work on analyzing the aggregate sizes. So with that, I will wrap up. Well, thank you, Dr. Sim, for that outstanding presentation. Just as a reminder, if any of you have questions, please enter them into the text box on the side of the screen. And then following Dr. Booth's presentation, we will have a question and answering period where Dr. Booth and Dr. Sim will answer as many questions as possible. So without uh, further ado, it is uh, my honor to be able to introduce tonight's second speaker, Dr. Stephanie Booth. Dr. Booth did her undergraduate training at the University of London in microbiology, and then completed her Doctor of Philosophy degree and postdoctoral training in virology and biochemistry at the University of Oxford in England. In 1997, Dr. Booth relocated to Canada, where she soon joined the Public Health Agency of Canada's National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In addition to providing laboratory support for CJD diagnosis and surveillance in Canada, the National Microbiology Laboratory is a key player in response to outbreaks of infectious diseases around the world. It also houses Canada's only biosafety level four lab, which is the type of lab needed when studying pathogens such as Ebola. Dr. Booth is currently Chief of Molecular Pathobiology at the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is Canada's equivalent of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. She is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Booth's research focuses on human prion diseases, including the development of innovative molecular techniques for CJD surveillance and diagnosis. These studies include identifying biomarkers for early diagnosis, the development of animal and novel cell culture models of human prion diseases, and the use of genomics to determine the molecular mechanisms by which prions kill brain cells. Dr. Booth is particularly well known for her groundbreaking research on the role of microRNAs in prion disease. Tonight, uh, Dr. Booth will be talking about research connected to her CJD Foundation grant entitled Detection and Characterization of Rare Strains of Sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob Disease Using a Suite of Novel Biological and Biochemical Tools. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Stephanie Booth. Hi, so I'm Stephanie Booth and I'm based at the Canadian Science Centre for Human and Animal Health in Winnipeg. Uh, this is a facility dedicated to 
diagnosis and surveillance and research on infections uh, of human and animal diseases. So in our lab, we're hoping to generate more data on the phenotypes of the cases that we see in Canada and the, the strains and the subtypes, uh, MM1, VV1, and we're hoping to be able to determine more atypical cases and investigate those in more detail, especially given uh, the rise of CWD in North America and how it's expanding the range of disease in deer and elk across the country. And we'd like to be able to keep a closer eye on the, the types of CJD that found. So to provide a focus for this retrospective study, uh, we decided to use tissues from cases originating from Alberta and Saskatchewan. Given that these provinces are the epicenter of the CWD epidemic in, Can in Canadian deer, and elk, we decided to assess the heterogeneity of CJD cases that already exist in these provinces as a baseline for enhanced surveillance. And we started with 32 cases for which we had frozen tissues available in the lab. These cases were various subtypes as listed in this table. And we also had information available such as medical histories, including any history of neurosurgery, and we have some brief description or history on whether these people participated in hunting or whether they'd consumed cervid meat at any time. So in the first instance, we decided to develop an assay that we could use to screen multiple samples simultaneously to assess for heterogeneity in the confirmation of CJD prions. We hypothesized that variations in the prion conformation are intrinsic to the strain characteristics of those prions and ultimately to the disease phenotypes, and that these may be detectable by methods that measure refolding kinetics. So we therefore investigated whether the seed substrate pairing has a direct relationship to the conversion rate using the quick assay. So this slide provides a quick primer to what's happening in the quick assay, which you're probably fairly familiar with. But briefly, we add misfolded prions uh, from a CJD brain homogenate, and this induces the refolding of the normal pre prion protein to produce aggregates. And using vigorous shaking, we break up these aggregates to amplify the number of seeds, and this can be repeated cyclically as a chain reaction and usefully the aggregated protein is detected with incorporation of a fluorescent dye. And so we hypothesize that when we have confirmationally distinct CJD, they replicate with slightly different kinetics in multiple different substrates. So producing a kind of fingerprint for each uh, type or subtype. So what we did was prepared a number of different substrates using full length and also truncated prion genes from different species. And so we measure the conversion rate by comparing the time at which fluorescence in a given reaction exceeds the predefined threshold, which we call the lag phase. And we correlated uh, each plate using a standard on the run. So each run we use an identical prion sample and we can uh, normalize each plate quite accurately, we found with this method. And so in this first graph, we show how the lag phases in these three different substrates compare with, I think in this graph, there's about 25 cases on there in a bank vole, hamster and a mouse protein substrate. So we found that this assay was rapid and scalable, and it enabled the direct comparison of these many different cases, as you can see. And we found that we have one major cluster and we have some outliers that I've colored in. So we see these outliers at the bottom of the graph and at uh, this end of the graph. And when we correlated these outliers by looking at the biochemical, analysis on a gel and by comparing with the clinical and pathology reports for these cases, we found that each of them had some atypical feature related to either their pathology or their, their biochemical Western blots. So this blue case, for example, has slightly higher bands 
that we see on the western, particularly the diglycosylated isoform. The pink sample colored here um, had a 20 kilodalton band uh, that ran in between 21, 19, the typical type 1 and type 2 case um, molecular weights by Western blot. And this sample annotated in turquoise. It looked identical to a typical one case on Western blot. Here, the one cases are colored gray, the V2 cases are colored in brown, but it looked identical to a typical one case on Western blot. But when we did a denaturation assay, we found that it had different properties. It seemed to be more more stable by temperature. We can see here on the graph and on the plot, and we can see these three denaturation profiles for three different MM1 cases. And this was our atypical one that seemed to be more stable. So out of 18 or so MM1 cases that were all identical, this one did appear to be slightly different. So we do think that outliers are showing cases with atypical features quite accurately. Interestingly, these two green cases that we found who also looked very atypical on our uh, diagnostic surveillance western blots, although type case A was designated as a VV type 1 case and case B was designated as a VV type 2 case uh, through surveillance. But when we ran them on a western, we were suspicious based on their long duration of disease, 45 months for one of the cases, 14 for the other. One of them did show remarkable on the pathology. Nothing uh, abnormal was or uh, remarkable was highlighted, but we were suspicious that they might be VP variably protease sensitive cases. And so we ran them on a Western blot with antibody 1E4 and we did see these typical bands that confirmed they were VPSPR profile cases. The next assay we started to develop uh, was a more sensitive Western blot assay using a, a simple Western capillary based capillary immunoassay. And so we decided to look at this system. One of the main reasons is it, it's increased sensitivity over normal Western blots and its ability to perform semi-quantitative analysis. So here we used recombinant hamster protein just to look at the sensitivity. And we found that it was at least 10 to 100 fold higher than traditional Western blot using the antibody 3F4. And this is the output you get for the capillary based e electrophoresis. It can produce a phony Western blot picture, or the main output is this electropherogram. And we can quantitate the band equivalent to the band on a gel by calculating the area under this peak. So next we tried loading uh, proteinase K digested protein isolated from a human CJD case. We prepared the protein from a 10% brain homogenate of a type subtype case, used proteinase K to digest it, just like we would do for the Western blot. This is, in fact, the Western blot in panel A. And then when we loaded it onto the capillary, we basically just got get this big messy peak, as we see in B. We suspected it was contained high molecular weight aggregates and insoluble aggregates which cause this uh, peak, even though it looks beautiful by Western. And when we increase the molecular weight analysis, we do see that there's a lot of insoluble high molecular weight aggregate on the electropherogram. After this messy band wasn't really useful at all. And we did try many different methods to kind of improve the results that we saw. We loaded different amounts of protein. We loaded different amounts of PK digestion. We used different buffers for loading. We used different amounts of starting material and nothing made any difference to this. We always got this big messy peak. We were almost about to give up, but then we decided to try phosphotungstate precipitation, which is a method that's often used to precipitate and concentrate infectious prion protein from tissue samples. So we used PTA precipitation, 
prior to digesting. And this is what it looked like on the gel. It looks, it's the same starting sample that we used in uh, the Western on in A. The Western looks, profile looks a little bit different, but when we loaded this uh, protein onto the capillary, we saw a huge difference. We're immediately able to see our three glycoforms bands, the unglycosylated monoglycosylated and diglycosylated band. When we ran it out to a, a look at high molecular weight, we did see a tiny little bit of aggregation, but basically all this big aggregated mess of protein disappeared. After PTA precipitation, we did use type 1 and type 2 proteins on the capillary and in each case, uh, we used about 40 samples, and in each case, we were able to discriminate type 1 or type 2 based on the electropherogram molecular weights. And particularly useful was the use of a lower matrix, a matrix that was ded that is dedicated to looking at tiny proteins, 2 to 40 kilodalton proteins. And when we load our prion protein onto this matrix, we only see the unglycosylated and the diglycosylated band, but the assay was even more sensitive and we were, gave us much more confidence in diagnosing type 1 and type 2 by the electropherogram. So we do have a number of cases that appear to contain mixtures of type 1 and type 2 prions in our cohort. This is a western blot of one of those cases in panel A. It clearly shows the two bands at 21 and 19 kilodaltons, but after we PTA precipitated, we always got this single banding pattern. This, we thought this was unusual and we actually picked out quite a number of different cases where we had uh, these mixtures and we always ended up with a single banding pattern after PTA precipitation and when we run these on the electropherogram in panel B we always get these nice peaks and uh, no hint of a double band. So we went on from this to actually take PTA precipitated type 1 and type 2 proteins, we mix those together and then we loaded onto the electropherogram onto the capillary and the electropherogram showed again a single band but there was always slightly wider band for the unglycosylated protein than the sharp peak that we see before and so our conclusion was that if we have a mixture of bands uh, we can't discriminate as closely as two kilodaltons on the by the capillary an analysis method. So given that the capillary was very sensitive for small molecular weight proteins on the matrix that was specially designed for 2 to 40 kilodaltons, we decided to look at the variably protease sensitive cases. Here we show the western blot for those cases with antibody 1E4. I didn't show 3F4 because the bands were so faint. Case one of the cases was in panel B, one in panel C, and those were run with 3F4 and we clearly see these small bands with 3F4. E and F are the same cases run with antibody 1E4, which clearly shows similar pattern. This just shows the increased sensitivity of the capillary method that we could use 3F4 quite with a lot of confidence in this case. And we actually can look at these two cases together by uh, combining the electropherograms and we can can see we can look for subtle differences in the banding patterns of the tiny proteinase K resistant bands with quite a lot of uh, confidence in discriminating the different sizes using the capillary. So we think it's particularly interesting or particularly useful technique for looking at variably protease sensitive cases and looking for small molecular weight bands. So next, we've just started looking at a new animal model to analyze our CJD cases. So we do have a colony of deer mice that our lab holds for various other infectious diseases. And so we decided to inoculate them with CJD and see what happened. And we did find a 100% attack rate for sporadic CJD of type 1 in these deer mice with a DPI of about 230 days. And this decreased to about 160 days on the second passage. We got really high titers of prions. So we've this seems to be a nice model for CJD. 
And as I mentioned, we're just at the early stages. We've passaged a couple of the atypical cases and two of these, they do seem to have different incubation periods after we've um, inoculated them from the typical, which was about 230 days post-infection, but we're still at early, early stages and we haven't looked at all these tissues so far. We have also inoculated with chronic wasting disease from elk, and this gave a incubation period of about 400 days on the first passage. And we've also just started inoculations with uh, V2, MM2, and some further atypical cases. So we're, we're trying to develop this model and see how it goes. So that'll be something for the future. The animal model has been a little bit delayed due to COVID. So I'd just like to give some acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, Dr. Sim and, and Dr. Booth for those fantastic presentations. And, and thank you to everybody who's, who's attended the, uh, the talks tonight. Uh, now is time for the, uh, the question and answer period. If uh, any of you have questions, please continue to type them into the box and, uh, and we'll get uh, Dr. Sim and Dr. Booth to answer them. Uh, some questions have come in already. And so let me start with uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Sim. Uh, the first question is, how do you get the prions to stick to the wires? Good question. Well, we don't have to do much. Prions are sticky. And in fact, the idea for doing this came from studies from years ago, recognizing that in brain tissue or surgical instruments used in brain operations, there was a concern that the prions would stick to the stainless steel of those instruments and contribute to iatrogenic infection. So there's actually been a number of studies on how to clean prions off of stainless steel and so we really based it on that literature that we knew prions bound stainless steel quite well, but we did expand it, as I mentioned, to a number of different compounds, different types of wires to see if there was one that was stickier or better to use. But in the end, to culture it for that long without it rusting or oxidizing, we found that stainless steel seemed to be the best. So we didn't have to do much to make them stick other than basically dry them down onto the, uh, the wire itself. And uh, another question that has come in is, first of all, everybody says, excellent work, Dr. Sim. You should get that in there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the question is, is whether there are any tools or probes that could be used to monitor prion localization in other cellular and subcellular organelles in your slice culture assay? Very good question. So it comes down to where are the prions? which is what we're very interested in answering. The trick is how to see the prions. And we have a couple of options. The first is to kill our slice, mush it up, run a Western blot and get a sense of whether there are prions in there. Obviously that doesn't tell us where in the slice the prions are. The other method I showed was to transfer it and do this imaging blot to get a general sense of where it is on a macro scale within the slice itself. When we start to zoom in to see the prions, we are just at this stage, we need to discriminate what is the normal prion and what is the misfolded prion. Because right now, the tools that we have involve antibodies. These antibodies recognize prion protein, but they don't discriminate between the normal form of the prion protein and the misfolded form of the prion protein. Now, if I do that blot, I can use an enzyme to digest all of the normal proteins away, leaving behind this fingerprint of prions. But if I'm trying to look at a cell and the organelles inside the cell, I can't really digest away everything because then I may see the prions, but I don't know what cell they were in. So that's the trick right now about figuring that out. If we fix the slice, label for prions and organelles, we can try to compare infected slices and uninfected slices to tease that apart. But right now, our, goal, our only indication that it's the misfolded prion protein is if it's kind of clumped or stuck together a bit. 
And again, that's not as precise as we'd like it to be. I will add one more thing because we have been thinking about this. And at one point we were toying with the idea of uh, basically a, uh, using a hydrogel that could expand our slice, essentially pull apart into a grid the entire contents of uh, the different organelles and slices, um, and then fix that in structure with all the labels in place, then digest away the proteins, leaving behind the fluorophores that show me where the cell bits are, then go in and look for prions. Anyways, needless to say, that's complicated. And we played with it a little bit and created some interesting gelatinous brain things, but uh, we haven't made that into a work of art yet, but maybe we'll explore that further. Gelatinous brain things. Yeah. Sounds appetizing right around dinner. It was kind of wild. <laughs> I have a very creative PhD student. Let's put it that way. Uh, let me move on to a, a couple of questions for Dr. Booth. Um, the first is, are type 1 and type 2 prions the same molecule, just folded differently, or are they different molecules? Okay, so uh, we assume that they're, well, they are the same molecule, but we assume that they're folded differently. And we because we can't see them, uh, down the microscope or with some direct method, uh, we know that some antibody probes bind to uh, one type versus the other type. And so because they bind to a specific shape of the molecule, uh, we know that they must be folded slightly different. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there might be multiple type ones, multiple type twos. It's a specific feature of the shape. And then a, a related question to that is, um, why is it important to be able to discriminate between type one and type two? What, what does this help accomplish? Okay, so back in the eighties, everybody probably heard about the BSC epidemic and in the UK and uh, beef contaminated with prions that unfortunately was able to cross to some people after they ate um, contaminated beef. Unfortunately, it wasn't a huge number, but it, it, it did happen uh, to some people. And we started doing surveillance and looking at the prions more closely in humans just to see if we could uh, discriminate between those that came uh, from our normal methods that cause CJD, which we don't exactly know, are those that uh, were transmitted from uh, contaminated beef. And what we found was that uh, the ones from beef all had this type 2 configuration. And in addition to that, they had a very um, specific shape when we looked at them with various biochemical tests. So, so that's why we look at whether there's type 1 and type 2 to see if we can see any uh, rare cases or any cases that might come from a zoonotic transmission. Originally, we were mainly looking for BSC, but now in North America, we know that there's this other disease, CWD, that's uh, um, getting to be high levels in various parts of the, the uh, Canada and also the US. And so what we're really doing is looking to see if we have more of one type than another that uh, is starting to be a trend or it's just keeping track of what types we have, whether they're the same as we had in the past or whether those types are changing in proportion that might indicate potential for zoonotic transmission or any other type of prion disease, iatrogenic transmission in some way. So it, it, it's a tool for surveillance. Thank you. Um, one more question uh, for Dr. Booth for the moment. And this is um, uh, a question that just came in. And that is, what was the specific USGS map of North America that you shared at the beginning of your presentation? Okay, so that map from USGS just shows the most recent data available on uh, the CWD instance in North America where it's cropped up uh, and the different colors I think were labeled on 
on the slide, which I can't see right now, so I can't tell you what they are from memory. Uh, but if you look at those, it tells you uh, where CWD cases have arisen, which provinces in Canada, which states in the US, and the incidence and whether it's in wild animals. Uh, yeah, so it gives you an idea of uh, CWD. And if you go to the UCGS website, you can see uh, data, yearly data, or monthly data going back sometimes. So you can actually look at how CWD has spread uh, throughout North America over the last few years. All right, um, let's go back to, to Dr. Sim now. Here's a, a, another question from the audience. It says, given your results, does does this mean that microglia might be used to clear prions and cure CJD? Sure. I wish that was as simple as an answer. As many things are in biology, there are there's the good, the bad, and I suppose the ugly. In microglia, they can do a lot of good, but they have a bad side too. If you think about it, they're the inflammation cells of the brain, and their goal is to clean up and to get rid of stuff we don't want in the brain. The challenge is if you have ongoing inflammation and they're revved up for a long period of time, they release toxins effectively that damage the structures of the brain. So it's a balancing act between clearing what you don't want, but not going crazy so that you digest away parts of the brain itself. And I think with prion disease, what one of, the, one of the many things that fascinates me about this disease is the timing of events. What triggers the next step? We know that there's a conversion happening at the beginning of the disease, we think. But it is a long time of conversion happening before we actually see the aggregate, the aggregate that's resistant, and even longer before we start to see pathology, and then clinical symptoms. So what is the link? How does that connect? And is a microglial response early on beneficial in helping keep things in, under wraps and clearing things? But later, if things are out of control and the microglia can't clean up anymore, could they do more harm? So it's not as simple as just saying, well, let's turn up the microglia. It may all be about the timing which as many of you may already be aware in prion disease is a big challenge because the disease is so fast and probably starts well before we see the symptoms. All that being said, we are definitely hoping to look at that because we have the microglia in our culture. We know how to turn them on and we know how to suppress them and then see if we can make a difference in what happens in the infection. Can, can you use the, the brain slice assay to, uh, to identify or, or test drugs for, for treating prion disease? Absolutely. And we have done some of that in the past. It's not fast. It's not high throughput, um, but you can do it. And people will screen, you know, thousands of compounds in these, you know, 96 or what is, what's the next multiple 382, whatever, <laughs> giant plates to look for compounds that block conversion. So the prion protein changing shape with the hope that if we use those compounds, it will lead to benefit in the brain or in the animal. The trick is, as I say, if you already have conversion happening and it's triggered a cascade towards cell death, is that gonna be enough? The nice thing about the slice model is we have both conversion happening and cell death happening. So it allows us to choose our timing of treatment if we block conversion or if we have something neuroprotective or both. And I still propose that it's more than one agent that is going to be necessary to help people with this disease, not just blocking the conversion component, but addressing the cell death side of things. That is where I think a brain slice culture is really useful because I can add multiple things all at once right onto the brain slice itself. In an animal model, you have to administer the drug. You're not always sure how much gets into the brain, the timing of it, and what it's actually doing during the disease until the end of the disease course. That being said, that means you need the drugs. 
So that's where we need the ideas, the drugs, the compounds that we think have a chance of working and then test them in the culture. Uh, Dr. Booth, a question from, from the audience. How many different ways are there in which PRPC can misfold? Are we talking a handful or hundreds? Okay, this, this is a, one of those amazing things about prions. It's a small protein. It looks fairly simple compared to many other proteins, but it seems to be pretty amazing in its ability to refold. So I, we know, as I said, we can't know for sure because we can't look at it directly and see how it's refolding. So we can only infer it by um, how it behaves in certain situations. But I, we think it definitely refolds a handful of different uh, ways. I wouldn't think, or I wouldn't expect it to refold hundreds of different ways, but <laughs> it's really difficult to say. <laughs> definitely a handful. <laughs> and I mean, and maybe there may I'll... also be other things that influence that. There could be lipid interactions with it, different glycosylation, different sugars that are bound to the protein. Um, yeah, different things that influence that. So that may also be playing a role in the phenotype of the disease apart from the actual protein refold. So, but we just know very little about that. I was going to oh, add, if I can. Oh, were you going to? Sure. I was saying we can. We also know we can take this protein, the normal form of it, in a test tube and make it misfold into different shapes, and those shapes are not causative of disease. We inject those into an animal, we don't trigger disease. So not only can the prion protein turn into multiple different shapes, some of those shapes are not relevant to disease. Just you know to confuse things. Yeah, I think Dr. Sim makes a very good point. And even in the, um, the RT quick assay that Dr. Booth was talking about, it's such a useful diagnostic test, but yet the, the things that you are producing in the plates aren't actually very infectious. And so therefore it's not a, you're not amplifying and multiplying prions in, in a plate when doing this. And therefore it's a, a relatively safe uh, diagnostic test. Um, Dr. Booth, if I may ask a, a question on my own, um, at mm -hmm. the end of your presentation, you showed this very striking result that um, CJD prions transmitted really well to mice expressing deer PRP. Now, I was just wondering no. sort of if you could explain a little bit more about what you think the implications of that are and whether, whether or not the, the converse is true. Do, do CWD deer prions transmit disease to mice expressing the human prion protein? Okay, um, yeah, just to clarify, that wasn't a transgenic mouse. It's actually a deer mouse perimiscus. Uh, oh, okay. So it's a, a type of bowl, and it's one of those things that we did because we can't uh, breed mice in our facility, so we don't have a huge range of transgenic mice, and we can't have colonies, uh, so we don't have any bank voles. <laughs> so... But there is a colony of these deer mice in the University of Manitoba. So we kind of just tried them out to see if we could transmit CJD. And there had been a previous study in the US that transmitted CWD to those, but it took 550 days or so for the animals to get sick. So we were expecting something similar with um, human CJD because... Uh, we expected it to be similar because in bank voles, the transmission is similar at 200 days. But then we were surprised uh, that when we did inoculate with CJD, it, it came pretty quickly. Um, so we have this model now, which is unlike bank voles, they don't uh, get the disease CWD or CJD at a similar time. They, it takes a long time to get CWD and a short time to get uh, CJD. So we figure we might use this model to see if any CWD strains are more transmissible to humans by seeing if the um, incubation period is reduced in those mice. So it was just a fortuitous model that kind of worked for us. It was a wild type uh, animal model. So, 
Yeah. I, uh, Can I have some to put in slice culture? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we were wanting to do some slice culture too with these mice, but we've yeah. not been allowed to do that. Uh, due to COVID. So we yeah. can't do slice culture things, but we have been allowed to do the infectivity. <laughs> Bigger, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows why? But well, we know why because we don't have yeah. much uh, facility for animals at the moment. It's all yeah. been, yeah. Yep. All right. I have, uh, there's one more uh, sort of very specific question for Dr. Sim. And then I want to get into a, a couple of sort of more general questions for, for both of you, big picture sort of things. Uh, the question for Dr. Sim is, is there an appreciation for the possible preference of, of prions to stick, e.g. Uh, stainless steel versus copper? Uh, how, how does the stickiness to stainless steel compare to brain tissue? So, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Speaking of sticky, <laughs> my, copy. It's my COVID therapy right here. Uh, so we didn't do a detailed analysis of uh, degree of stickiness to the different um, compounds as much as look at would they first stick and secondly, not oxidize or disintegrate during culturing in the media. Um, so I, we do get binding to copper, but again, you leave copper in a liquid environment and then it oxidizes. So that's why we didn't persist in using it. Um, so I don't have a detailed analysis of binding uh, to those different compounds. There may be some older literature on it, though. I could probably dig up when pe people were looking at tools, surgical tools, and was there a substitute or something else they could use instead. So I think there's a bit of literature on that that I just don't have at the top of my head. But from our own studies, uh, we mostly just tried to find something that that worked for our purposes and, and ran with that. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, and then in terms of its stickiness to the brain itself, um, if you mean when we expose the slices to the prions and then wash it and we see a little bit left, I can tell you that we have been doing this for many, many years with a number of different strains. And it was a surprise to see this because at least with the rodent adapted scrapey strains, so coming out of mice, we don't see this. So there is something different in this CJD brain homogenate, recognizing it's also human brain. So there is something about it that definitely is different to work with compared to what's passage through mice. But I don't know if it's the prions or something else in that brain material. I just don't. I just don't know. All right. Um, a question that is almost always the first topic of conversation that come up comes up between conversations, uh, you know, among scientists these days. And indeed, it was actually posed by a, a member of tonight's audience as well as how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your ability to do research? And maybe we'll start with uh, with Dr. Booth. Okay, so I'm working in the National Microbiology Lab, so it's a public health agency lab. So pretty much we can we we've been able to do research, but uh, on COVID, <laughs> so we've had to switch focus a little bit. We've been uh, our staff have been deployed to work on COVID surveillance and COVID sequencing and COVID diagnostic projects and all sorts of things, wastewater detection. Uh, so that's really affected our ability to do prion research because all our staff are deployed. So, uh, so basically the work has been done by the couple of grad students that are left. Um, and even they were kept out of the lab for many months till, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it is really, ex it's really hampered our ability to do pre on research, but we're able, we have been able to do some interesting research on COVID. So yeah, just being flexible. <laughs> Dr. Sim? Yeah. Well, uh, it's a complex question because I'm also a clinician. So I have been in the hospital seeing COVID patients in addition to the lab and been on a number of backup COVID call schedules. So that has affected my own psyche as well and psychology. Um, it did shut down the labs on and off for some time um, because of restrictions. Um, one of my research associates um, was actually stuck outside of the country for six months, unable to return 
because of travel restrictions. So fortunately it gave him an excuse to work on writing his paper, but that of course dramatically affected things. And the logistics of doing work when restrictions were lessened, but you had to still have distancing, masking and separation. Like my PhD student essentially started working night shifts. So she only comes in at night to get things done. Um, I joked a little bit that being in a prion biocontainment lab was one of the safer places to be in society compared to out where the COVID was running rampant. But we were not able to keep running our animal facility at full strength. I had to get rid of some animal colonies because we weren't guaranteed we'd have the support staff, even the building support staff to keep things running. So all experiments that were deemed non-essential had to get shut down and COVID experiments were allowed. I did not personally start COVID experiments, um, but it meant all the prion experiments had to stop unless I was able to make an argument that the few cultures that we had already set up and started, and as you can see, this takes some of the experiments last 60 days, I was able to get permission to continue growing those cultures so that at least we didn't lose those but we had to wait to do a lot of the analysis on them. And then when we could finally start things up, we had to breed the animals, get them breeding, then take them to prepare for slice culture and then do the math from there. So it has definitely been a struggle technically and emotionally, I will say, you know, dealing with all of this and the ups and downs. And here in Alberta right now, we are certainly in wave four full on. So it's been a challenge. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, that rings very true that it's been, it's, it's been a challenge for, for, for everybody. And, you know, thankfully we, we are all sort of dedicated to, uh, you know, the goal of, of, of curing prion disease eventually, and that we find ways to, to persist, you know, despite the challenges. Yep. yep. Um, and perhaps I'll, I'll end uh, as we kind of draw to an end of tonight's presentation on one more sort of big picture question. Um, and that is, okay, you've both received um, research grants from the CJD Foundation. I was wondering if you could sort of tell me where do you see this research going, stemming from this project over the next five years? You know, what is, what is the most important question that you would like to answer next? Um, and maybe since I see Dr. Sim here on my screen, she can answer the, uh, the question first. What do I want to answer next? Where do the prions go and why? Is that two questions? <laughs> I, you know, I really want to tease apart this question of what makes a particular strain, a particular size and shape of prion lead to the specific symptoms that a person presents with. Like that is such an important connection, not just for understanding the disease and diagnosing the disease, but even potentially a guide to treating it, to know what symptom is going to respond to which treatment because it's caused by this shape. And beyond prions, this same shape symptom correlation is having lots of implications for other neurodegenerative diseases as well. So I think it has the potential to really open up a new type of medicine, sort of shape-driven medicine, if you will, or strain-specific therapy. But we need these models that really mimic what we are seeing. Now, I can't ask a brain slice culture what symptom it has, so I have to rely on which part of the brain is more likely to contribute to a specific symptom. But I really want to pursue this avenue of, you know, how does shape inform clinical presentation, because from that knowledge comes so many possible um, next steps. Will we uncover that within the next five years? Not sure. I never thought I'd be buying acupuncture pins, but I am, and we're stabbing bits of brain. So you never know what the next uh, mistake or accident or success is going to point you uh, in a, a totally new direction. And that's the fun. That's what keeps you going is the, the fun of the discovery. But I will also just add that from the CJD Foundation perspective specifically, I am always very humbled by the support given 
by patients and families um, and those who really support the cause. Um, this kind of research is tough, it's challenging, lots of roadblocks. And to know that there are people out there rooting for us um, who are really vested in it certainly keeps me going as well. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Sin, for, for uh, raising that, uh, that very important point. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Booth, where, where do you see this research project going for you over the, over the next five years? And what, what important question do you want to answer next? Okay, so um, really this, this project has um, got our lab going in developing new ways to look at CJD surveillance. And there's so many offshoots from this that are coming already. Uh, for example, the, the, the mouse study that I presented, we've got some new cell culture models that we hope might be hopeful uh, or promising for replicating human prions in there that we might be able to test drugs on. Um, in the short term, we're going to incorporate some of our methods like the capillary electrophoresis in our surveillance and diagnostics program. So we're actually hoping to pick up more rare forms of, of prion disease over the next five years as they come through the system. And also contributing to this long-term um, aim of, of making sure or making sure that we if there was ever any CWD transmission to people who ate uh, deer or elk or anything associated with deer or elk, we'd be able to uh, detect that as soon as possible and, and stop it and put restrictions in place to, to make sure that was stopped or didn't happen. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's many fold benefits from the research going from basic research questions with our new models and uh, improved surveillance, enhanced surveillance with our uh, modified testing regime. Indeed, I, I think I completely agree with you that, you know, a, there's going, there needs to be a synergy between basic research and applied research. And I think that's going to be critical for ultimately solving, you know, the problem of, of prion disease. Um, with that, it, it, it's, it's getting somewhat late, so I, I suppose we should bring uh, the evening to, uh, to a conclusion. So I'd like to start by thanking once again our, our two uh, speakers for this evening, uh, Dr. Stephanie Booth and Dr. Valerie Sim, for their incredible presentations, for answering all of the um, you know, very great questions posed by, by the members of, the, of tonight's audience. And, and, and thank you to all of you who, are, who watched tonight and, and, who, um, and who asked those, those great questions. And uh, lastly, I have to thank the CJD Foundation for not only um, facilitating these research grants, but also putting on events like tonight so that uh, we as scientists get to, uh, to share our, our findings with, with, with the public. Um, I know that the uh, third panel is coming up soon, so remember to sign up for that. I think it's a, a great lineup as well. Uh, and with that, again, I'll thank everyone once again for coming and I hope everyone has a uh, fantastic evening. Thanks. <laughs>